Hello everyone, how are you all doing? Hope January has started as well as it can for you. Everyone now back at work, back at school, and the holidays seem like a distant dream. But don't fear, we are here to make you smile, entertain, keep you company, and hopefully remind you that though these months can feel dark and wet and cold, nothing will be as bad as how I will feel in a few days' time when I am waist deep in a bog, having wet through to my pants, lost my pull, <laughs> can't see out of one eye, probably, <laughs> lost an arm. This week, episode six of the Teen Trails podcast brings you a great conversation with James Nobles, our usual twittering, not as husky this week, I hope. Tales from the Trails and Brew with the Coaches. It's just Eddie and myself, so it's Brew with the Coach. Is that probably um, <laughs> a more accurate way to say it? And we talk about come back from illness because I am still coming back from illness again. It just seems like I'm bouncing along from illness to illness. Uh, and is it hooray, it's taper time, Eddie, or are you mega stressed? It's a menage. I sometimes feel this is lovely. I'm enjoying not doing, having fresh legs and having lots of energy. And then 99% of the time I feel sick and I'm really grumpy. And uh, I've got a very short fuse and everything annoying me, which it doesn't normally. I just feel like I want to punch somebody. <laughs> uh, I think you get yourself always ready. Not everybody will be like this, but I get myself into a sort of like fight. I imagine I'm like fighting for my life almost. I just want to start. I just want to start for God's sake. Yeah. Uh, and all the admin, all the kit and stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm sure I've forgotten. So it's all just too much. It's too much for me, Gary. I can't do it. Anyway, only a few more days. Once I get go, once I leave this house, it will be better. I can become yeah. runner Eddie, and I will. I am very good. We talked about this before about compartmentalizing. You know, once I go, I will then just focus on my job, what I've got to do. So, but at the moment, there's too many inflicting bits of my life. Um, you know, and every time I hug the kids, I'm like, oh. It would be nice to get through that uh, kid check on it. That would be awesome. Oh yeah, the kit check, just getting out of here, getting everything fine. Everything's like already the landing upstairs because we don't have um, carpet downstairs. So I've just used the landing upstairs because it's nicer to like roll around on the floor with carpet rather than cold floor. Um, it's just covered in kit. So I've sort of done a big pile of like what I'm starting wearing and then all the stuff I'm packing in my bag. And then I've done sort of a drop bag. And then there's my bag because I'm traveling. And there's so much to think about. So I'm traveling. I'm going to travel in. Then the bags. So then what bags? My drop bag. How am I? Oh, my God. How am I going to track? So I've got to unpack my drop bag to pack it to go on the plane. <laughs> Anyway, we're getting there. See, if you're doing a local race and you've got to get through kit check and get everything done, that stress is quite low because, yeah, you're quite in control of stuff. But when you physically go get on a plane and if you've left something behind, my anxiety will be through the roof. I'm that. very lucky that I have James Elson of the Centurion store on speed dial. Yeah. So I, every day my <laughs> list gets longer of, uh, could you also bring, and do you have, and awesome. would it be possible? Uh, <laughs> just add it to my bill, please. <laughs> So I am lucky Love and lots of friends um, that I know if I do get there and I've forgotten something really, as long as you've got like the key essentials. So in my hand luggage definitely will be my trainers um, because everything else really say that, imagine if they lost my bag, Gary. Oh, she's done it. Oh my God. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, so I always travel with my trainers. Like when I was a triathlete, I used to always have my goggles, swim hat, bike shoes and trainers yeah. so that if the worst happened, the little, the essential bits that you need, you've got everything else you could yeah. end up, you, were, you I just shout you up. You could come with about probably the same height. Oh, five, five, five foot six, five foot seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Taper week, taper week last week was still, it felt like I didn't do very much and I didn't look at Strava very much because I don't want to see what anyone else is doing, but I did about 50 miles, about 10,000 feet. My last long run hike, I thought, do you know what I'm going to do? Because all the snow had pretty much gone down to about 1,500 meters, maybe. I thought I'm going to go up to my climb, my top of the my nearest mountain and have my tea and, you know, have a moment up there and that'd be great. Anyway, the snow was off trying to get up. 
I had to put yak tracks on on the mud because it was so slippy. I couldn't get up. Why well, didn't just turn around? Because I thought if I turn around, that's not a good mental way yeah. to finish this training because I couldn't get up the hill. And then the snow was awful. Like some of the potholes were like up to the end of my thigh, crotch high. Um, so then then I was got to the top, couldn't see anything. It was freaking freezing. Anyway, I had my tea. Thought, well, this sums it up. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this is great. I thought, well, never mind. All I have to do is go down now. And the down was even worse than the up because the rain had washed all the little bits of grippy snow away and it was just like left ice of potholes. Oh, and no. all I was imagining myself was falling down one of these holes and breaking my leg and ending my life up there. Anyway, <sighs> so what normally is it like a really quick descent? I think my Strava thing is like three minutes down to like this turn. 25 minutes, Gary. 20 oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I did that. I did lots of jogging around without the pack. So I think I did two. Yeah, I did two runs with the pack. And the last one was on a beautiful day. Evie had gone up this other side of the mountain with ski club. And so I climbed up the back of it where there was grass and stood at the top looking at Mont Blanc. Could see Evie doing her little drills on her skis. And I thought, yeah, it's good. It's good to finish it. Had a massage, had my back cracked, doing all the essential um, and I just feel a bit sick and I just want to, Bryn keeps going, you're right, you're right there, love, you're right there, love. <laughs> and then like backing away, a bit stressed. <laughs> uh, it didn't help yesterday that we had a huge, like we have these, like we live in a really steep sided valley outside Morzine and we get a lot of storms where the, the uh, rain and the wind comes and hits and then it tunnels down it basically blows itself out by tunneling it down this valley um so we do get a lot of like you would not believe the noise of these storms anyway we had it sounded like the house i felt like dorothy in the wizard of oz really? it sounded like the house was going to take off this is two o'clock in the morning the week of the spine when i want to bank my sleep out of the window we couldn't see anything because the snow was being like twirled around oh you goodness. see the odd bit of corrugated iron or wood or tree flying down the road anyway I think there's one of these or, snow bombs i hear about these in the states where these snow bomb storms it was it was big anyway we the electricity often then fuses um so it went and it went oh. off and then it came back on again and then it all went off and we were hit. It's like a horror movie. We don't have, there's no street light. There's no lights. You know, if we didn't have any lights on, it's lovely. So if you go outside, you can see all the stars and everything. So Bryn went down, disturbed the dogs. Um, and he's like, oh, I can't find, there's no trip switch down. I was like, oh, wow, come on. Then all the kids woke up because they're like, what the yeah. I'm really scared. I was like, right, come on, everybody in the bed. Me at the end, you know, Bryn was like, I'm not sleeping in here. I'm out of here. Um, and next morning, pitch black, got up to get them ready. Took no electricity anywhere. <laughs> oh, so I lit all the candles and um, so we walked out to see if anyone else had electricity. No one else had electricity. Um, we we're sort of trying to, one kid had to go skiing. So we we're trying to like find all the stuff with torches. Just, oh, goodness anyway, me. then the middle child said, why don't we put head torches on? Like, oh, okay. There's some brains here. Yeah. So we had head torches on. Anyway, the, the electricity then stayed off all day. I know these are first world problems, but I've got a race to plan for. So I had no Wi-Fi. I couldn't charge my phone. I, I thought, oh, I was my like, okay, well, I can do some cleaning. I'll hoover the house and clean the floors. Oh, I can't even hoover. Can't do anything. I could not do anything, which maybe was quite a good thing. Anyway, it did eventually come on. Do you remember in the UK? Um, you, I'm maybe a little bit older. I'm a little bit older than you, but I remember as a child, power cuts being okay. quite a regular. I'm like fifty. I'm like thirty-two, Gary. <laughs> but power cuts seemed like quite a regular occurrence when I was growing up. Um, but now, if the power cut would like knock me for six. Yeah, I know. We do. We do get them often, but that was a that was an all day one. And the last thing we did last week, which saved the best to last, is we went to the ballet, not the, the musical. Opera. The musical Swan Lake. <laughs> I expose myself for uh, our oh, little culture. Oh okay, yeah, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zero culture in, in my life. You've as a got child. loads of culture. Anyway, it was the Ukrainian. I can't remember. If I told you that it was the Ukrainian national ballet. Oh, that's um, yeah. So it was something, and at the end, they got the Ukrainian flags out and sang the Ukrainian national anthem. Beautiful. Loved the music and. 
the highlight for the girls, so we all took our little girls, was the fact we saw the ballet dancers at the end outside having a bag. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> They've been these beautiful swans. Do, do, do. And then we walked out to go and get back in the car. And there they all are in their rug boots having a flag. Oh, there we go. The dream was broken. Anyway, it was lovely. It was lovely to do something different and um, a bit random when you live up the mountain, drive around the mountain. But it was packed, Gary. It was quite, I've never been to this theatre. And there was, it was absolutely random. There were people at the doors like going, has anyone got tickets? Oh, wow. The mountain people are stuck of a bit of musical uh, opera ballet culture. <laughs> the market for it. That sounds awesome. You know, I don't like when you go, if I go to a restaurant and um, you see the staff out the back having a fag, especially when the food involved. Well, you you just see the kitchen really in the chef. And you oh, think, yeah. <laughs> so let's keep it. Let's keep the dream alive. <laughs> anyway, how are you? How are you, Gary? You're still here, still alive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> still <laughs> spluttering and coughing. Loads better. My goodness me. I after we so I smugly said last week about these red challenges and oh yeah, it's easy every day for someone like myself. I run every day, that's not a problem. And then literally Baby maybe not Jesus the, struck you down. Yeah, it was like <laughs> it got me big time. I'm not too sure if it was Wednesday or Thursday, but I missed two days of running all i could manage was a, a dog walk and what was so nice with the my eyes were really that this is quite horrible actually my eyes were really sensitive to the light but walking the dog was so pleasant because it wasn't hard oh, that cool breeze on my eyes yeah. was um oh gary so apologies uh, for all these red runners out there and i was kind of being pretty smug and then um literally two days later i was um Walking, All right, we but... love taking smugness down on this podcast. <laughs> but as far as the runs are concerned, so easy run on a Monday, then I did my minutes. That was the, probably the only session I did. Then I went to the gym on Tuesday too. But because I was I was feeling poorly on Tuesday, I did my minutes on a hill because I was scared or didn't really want to see how slow I was running. So I thought if I stick on a hill and at least the effort will be there, I will pay no attention to the pace. And I, you know, I felt okay doing that. And it was only then, I think the Wednesday I felt okay, but then Thursday, yeah, it really struck me down. Didn't do cross country. I dodged that all together. Oh, you didn't do cross country. Oh. I know, yeah. It was, it was big, I, I probably would have toward the line if it was the harrier leg so if it was short for a runner i would have went i did run on saturday still i went for about six seven miles in castellane dean so i did run but super slow and i did the home course session because i i've been thinking these gym sessions none of them are, there's always an element where i do touch my core but i don't really focus on it so i thought i'd do a home core session with that that was good another easy run on sunday too and then I started moving away from the comfort of the machines at the gym. Oh, and I was shuffled over to the squat rack and the um, the deadlift machine rack thing. What I was finding when I was doing squats, when I was lifting the weights off the rack onto my shoulder, was fine doing them. But then I couldn't get them off my shoulders to put them back on the yeah, rack. Yeah, yeah. So I needed the rack to... Um... Has it not got a Smith machine? So oh, yeah, it's got all of that. I was I was just really scared to use all that stuff. Oh, so. that's what I always use for squats when I'm by myself because yeah. it's so much easier to get them on. But the weight itself, I think 30 kilos, and then plus, I suppose plus the bar. But to then after I've done my six yeah, or eight yeah, to get that yeah, my yeah. it was quite hard. But I do, I think because the deadlift's probably more important, I need to, I've watched lots of YouTube videos. I think I know what I'm doing. But when you increase that weight, I think I probably need to get one of the instructors just to make sure I'm not going to damage my back. I'm branching out different elements of the Damn. of the gym. Um, total 57 miles, 14 hours and 5,000 feet. So... That was that. Ooh, podcast wise, hustling away behind the scenes, trying to get some you value. You are hustling. <laughs> God, you're the king of hustling, Gary. Hopefully, soon we'll have some partners um, and some competition prizes for our listeners, too. So that'll be awesome. And the big news is, which fits pretty great with this week's show, actually, with the guest this week, I'm going to be on the start line for the 2023 Dragons Back race. Hopefully, you know, there is, it's changed now as the format. If you, I suppose, DNF, you can drop down to this hatchling race they do if you don't fancy the the, the, the full days. Yeah, see your face. <laughs> I have to go to YouTube, everybody. <laughs> My 100% goal is to, you know, just stay on the full course for the um, six days. I think it's right. It's saying six days. 
I think it's just how many guys, how many days this race we're doing? Yeah, what have I signed up for? Oh, geez, I could be home by oh, after four days, but call Lisa. This is super exciting because. And no offense, we followed your journey to Lakeland 100 once. We got to repeat that. But this is going to put you out of your uh, comfort zone yeah. many, many times. I enjoy seeing you with three points of contact on Crib Gok. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be super scary. That is, especially no, when it's Russell. Not. It's not. You just keep moving. Yeah. I'd go and meet Russell for a couple of days and get him to take you across all the sketchy stuff. And I'm, when you've done that sort of stuff once, it's never. It's never as bad. As I just I know that from the Bob. Um, there's elements on that the first time I went on. I thought, oh, I'm not too sure. If I... And as ever, when you're in a race, you like you you just do it. Uh, just totally going off topic now is Bryn and I have got stuck into watching The Traitors. Have you, did you watch it when it was on? We're a bit behind. It was on no, just before Christmas. I've heard of talking it. About, talking about, we could hear, we heard it on the radio and I was like, I think we should watch this, Bryn. And he's like, reality show, that is what you watch in your private time, Edwina. Yeah. That's not something we share. <laughs> anyway, we've got, we've got so into it. And um, it is really good because it's basically... Um, and loads of people listening will have watched it. Don't tell me because I'm only on episode five. Yeah, I, we've got to we've got to binge watch it. So the spine pre banking the sleep has gone out the window because we've binge watched it. So I'm like, gonna go back to England and everyone's gonna tell me what's happened. It's gonna be on magazines and stuff. Anyway, it's all psychological. It's all like they're basically you know telling each other lies and all this. Traitors so, yeah. or traitor. Traitors, the traitors. Actually, it would be quite good. I reckon kids of an older age would really enjoy Maybe there's a little bit of swearing. Um, but older age, your kids would probably quite enjoy it. Hmm. It's sort of like, and because it's not been done before, like the early big brothers and stuff, they don't know how to play the game. Okay. And so yeah. it is quite, it is quite interesting to Ooh. watch how they make. Yeah, it's good. Anyway. We're watching Bob's Burgers. That's how we <laughs> A family choice. I mean, I'd say, but oh my goodness me! If you got Disney, go and watch Bob's Burgers. It's no. awesome. Is it good? Okay, we'll yeah. look it up. like a grown-up animated cartoon. Getting back to Dragon's Back Race. How lucky are we? You know, Bryn got a wealth of knowledge, and Trish and Russell too. So He's got a wealth. I was saying to Gary before we started recording. I've coached. Oh, I can't remember how many people. Three or four people to Dragon's Back finishes now. Ooh. Never failed, Gary. Never failed my coaches at Dragon's Back. So we'll have a whole new coach. Ask, ask the coach section. So we can get. We can get. Um, yeah, we can get. Like, well, we'll start with James today, won't we? James, tell us everything. Yeah, yeah. But feel free to call me out. You know, I remember. Um, uh, quite a while ago um, on the podcast we had the green runners on there and my pledge was to only race in the north and obviously Wales is not the north so it's always better not to produce carbon than offset the carbon but I did you know when with the entry process I did uh offset the carbon do all those things but yeah now i'm looking for another way i can improve my uh i think maybe put it to green runners as well let's uh ask our friend david and see what uh what do you you know if, if the, the pledge that you made <clears throat> you're then like what so what else in my life can i then just change yeah. maybe to offset the carbon or yeah as you said not produce the carbon in the first yeah. place but it was good to see they on their social media they'd reach 500 members milestone or so that which was good so anybody who's interested yeah go and check out the green runners i think you could google that and that would take you to their various platforms but that is me busy busy week This week's brew with the coaches is all about coming back from illness. And as we mentioned in the uh, intro and probably from last week, my husky voice, I think it's safe to say I'm coming back from illness, Eddie. So, you know, I'm not a coach, but what I do when I come back from illness and somebody who's got some qualifications, uh, what she would advise her clients to do and herself to do when she is coming back from illness. So, yeah, how do you approach it, Eddie? Well, it's a tricky one because especially at the moment, there seems to be this horrible cold going on that lingers and lingers and lingers um, and has made people feel ill for weeks on end. And then lots of people, it's then developed into like chest infections and pneumonia yeah. and stuff. So there is some nasty stuff going around, especially 
especially post COVID, people seem to, the immune system seems to be taking a bit of a battering. I did hear on the radio something about like COVID can, has changed our immune system immunity basically, and it can wipe out what we were immune to before. And Ooh. so then we're getting all these colds and stuff before. So it's worth bearing in mind that perhaps how we would deal with colds before COVID, it might be a little bit more like lots of us would have carried on training you know, if the cold was just a bit of snot in the head, we'd have been like, okay, so it's fine. That used to be the, the sort of guidelines, didn't it? Yeah. If you just had a bit of a head cold, you were okay, but you just took it really easily. You probably felt a bit rubbish anyway, so you weren't going to do any sessions. But then when it went down on your chest, that's when you have to be really careful because, and there is, um, there is evidence of this, that you need to be so careful if you're training with any more, anything more than a light heart cold, because it can, the virus can get into your heart and then damage your heart so if you this is not something to be like light-hearted about especially at the moment that if you are suffering from anything more than just a head cold rest is always best and this is where <clears throat> some of us gary have perhaps elongated the illness because we carry it we think we're getting a little bit better and we take that as a sign to then right let's get the training let's get the session back up i always so first thing for First, if you use a sort of monitoring system like a Garmin or a Whoop strap or anything like that is to check your resting heart rate. And this is why it's always a good idea to know what your sort of resting heart rate should be or your heart rate variability. And if you are feeling ill, nearly always that will be. Is your heart rate, resting heart rate been a bit higher, Gary? Or yeah, it has this one. That's what I was going to say, actually, the heart rate variability. I'm not really 100% clear on the data that Garmin gives me for the variability, but definitely my resting heart rate is a few beats higher. And yeah, that is a definitely a red flag because you could actually be feeling okay, but your heart rate will give you some little data that you might not be aware of. And also when you are sleep there's a lot of your wrist based heart rate can can be inaccurate when you're yeah, doing exercises it's, it's but it's pretty time. good it is pretty good when you're static so as far as that's concerned definitely, yeah, definitely. stand still all day and get your resting heart rate uh it, it you know it's easy to take your resting heart rate every morning and times but us as runners we're really in tune with our body we know when we don't feel very well and so the first thing you need to ask go to that inner bit and go am i really well enough to do this run yeah. um because we we all hate missing runs um but you can it you can get so much better. The biggest thing is that you need to rest. Rest yep. will tell a signal to your body as well that you rest, you've got the energy to uh, recover. It just lets everything, it lets that immune system do its job. Every time you go for a run, you're battering yourself just even just a little bit. And then you can make it worse as we've seen as well. Um, don't panic, especially at this time of year. Rest is always going to be best. Then when you come back, when you start to feel better, I would always say, remember, walking is your friend, just like you did. Just get some fresh air. You're going to feel much better for getting some fresh air. Focus on good food, rest, a little bit more sleep, all the things that you know that help you recover, protein. Don't cut back on calories because you're not training because the body needs the calories in order to fight whatever infection you've got. And then coming back to training like we all know, you don't jump straight back in. Like, okay, well, I'm meant to be at week four of this plan. I've missed two weeks. I'm just going to go straight back into week four. Five times a mile. A week. Yeah, five times a mile. Ten times a mile. Uh, 30 seconds recovery. Just have a little look um, at your plan and pull out little bits. I would always say I'd almost give myself from the minute I feel better another week of like introducing some super easy running. If it's been on your chest – do some training inside as well, some just some light biking to see how you feel afterwards. You did that session, Gary, and then it knocked you out then for like two or three days. So and it was only a small step, session. It was yeah, like 10 times a minute. away from any sort of... <laughs> Any sort of session, anything that elevates the heart rate. If you've got a heart rate monitor and you're used to using it, wear that and be really strict. Do some jogging, really short jogs. So again, like take don't don't worry about the training, don't worry about what you normally do. Twenty minutes, just see how you feel, or go for a dog walk, bit of jogging every day. You'll build, and you'll recover, you'll get back into it before you know it. And honestly, if you just come back really slowly. Don't do any, I would give it a week of really super easy jogging around. Don't worry about sessions. Remember you've got strides in there as well that you can always yeah. start to throw in a little bit to get back into it. Relax. Don't be stressed about jumping straight back into a plan because that's when illnesses can be elongated or become much worse than they originally were. Yeah. hundred percent. The food, I would not be, um, skipping meals or anything like that my body almost wants i know it's like a furnace it just wants to take more and more in and i almost crave 
good quality food for some reason. Um, I don't want that bar of chocolate. I want some. I want a glass of orange juice or something instead. And definitely, um, don't do the sessions. I missed the cross country. I knew I could cope. You know, I, I went for a run on Saturday, and it was just a social chat. Um, pretty slow walk some of the hills too. Um, but yeah, definitely wouldn't jump into a, a, a race. Um, and also, if you do, when you do come back. If you do feel like you want to try a session, give yourself some grace. If it doesn't go to plan, just don't be don't be afraid to uh, sack that off. And I would also, I wouldn't maybe come back and train with a group because ego can sometimes get in the way of uh, being sensible. I always think when you feel you can do a session, just like if you've had a little niggle, when it feels all better, give it another 48 hours. You know, because yeah. us as runners are always one, trying to be one step ahead and win at everything. So I always think like, okay, I feel totally better. I go for a run. Okay. Now I'm running, I'm back running 45 minutes to an hour. Super. I'm not sort of thinking, give it another couple of days and then a little session. With strides. Yeah. I think strides are a little bit of a hidden secret sauce for runners. We could all integrate those. And I think, yeah, especially if you're not doing any structured sessions, but you feel like you can run, then maybe, um, give some strides a go, but yeah, just give yourself a grace. I'd much, and I, you know, I'm guilty of this. I'm extending my illness <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking even maybe I'm going to do my 10 times one minute today. We will see, but you know, like, uh, see, so listens to all this, everybody. He's listened to all of this <laughs> and then he's still not hundred percent. He's going, I think I'll still do my session today. Yeah, so I, hashtag I'm, don't I'm, be like Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not macho enough though to go. I'm going to do it regardless. If, if I do two, and it doesn't feel good, then um, that will be that. And also don't do anything new. Uh, today for me, I was hoping to do my first um, kettlebell class in the gym. And because it's quite an unknown quantity for me currently, what that class involves, I'm just going to give it a wide berth completely. I might go to the gym and lift some weights because I don't. that didn't seem to really... Um, wipe me out in the same as like a hard session not, um, not lifting heavy enough then are you lifting, well my glutes will disagree with that <laughs> can fail, <laughs> fail them too but yeah i just say give yourself some grace quality food rest as much as possible and hopefully then that will reduce the uh, amount of time you're on the sidelines This week's guest is James Nobles. Now, James won the 2022 Dragon's Back race, so I'm super excited to pick his brains. <laughs> Abuse our position, basically. <laughs> Getting these for her. To be fair, we didn't know you were going to do the Dragon's Back when yeah. James got on touch. That is so true. It's just a luck of... Luck of the, luck luck of the, of the podcast. Draw. Yeah, podcast the world. We have been quite lucky, haven't we? Um, and what is awesome to be honest, he was a first, the first volunteer to win the Dragon's Back race. So that is super good. And by day, he's a research scientist at Leeds Beckett University. He's also a new daddy. I've seen some cute little baby pictures yeah. on Instagram. Hopefully the little baby might make a pop-up <laughs> appearance. Here's our chat with James. Hi, James. Welcome to the Tea and Trails podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. We've got fingers crossed we might get a six-week-old baby uh, delivery. <laughs> Just, uh, or we might hear a little uh, hear a little peek in the background. Uh, how are you? And can you share us a little bit of your story as a runner, where you find yourself today? Hello. Uh, good morning. It's lovely to, to be with you. I am... Um... I'm okay. <laughs> I've got a, a reasonable amount of sleep last night. Uh, so as far as, as having a six week old can go, I think we're, we're doing all right. You're um, very perky. I mean, you're stringing sentences together. I mean, you were 20 minutes late to the call, but we'll gloss that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I can maybe perhaps blame that on, on her, but no, I can't blame it on her. It's uh, my, my poor, poor diary management. But no, it's going really well. We're just trying to to learn now how to um, adapt our lives to having like a little baby with us and how like my wife, she's a keen runner, but she's not yet back to running. Um, I'm obviously trying to keep up with some of my training as well. So it's just trying to figure out like where are those little pockets and chunks of time to do the training, to maybe do some like gym work um, and how to make the most of pushing a buggy up some hills to get some added training wherever we can. Yeah. So 
yeah, that's that's I think how how uh, how things are going at the moment. Can you share us a little bit about how you find yourself? That we we had a little bit of a chat before the podcast started, and you slowly dropped in more and more of these little running nuggets of what you've achieved that we didn't know about. So, can you tell us a little bit about your history as a runner, where you how you find yourself today as a champion runner? Always been a runner. So, so going back maybe um, like fifteen years or so ago, I like, used to play quite a lot of rugby, um, and then I went to university and realised that I didn't want to play rugby there, but I needed something to do to like keep a bit of fitness up. So I just started doing some very, very, very casual like running whilst at university, um, up and down like the canal towpath, that sort of thing. And then it wasn't until I think maybe two thousand and I don't know, I'm going to say like sixteen, seventeen, where it kind of became a bit more of a passion. Then I went and helped um, a friend, Stuart, on his Bob Graham round. Um, and as for lots of people, like, I think that's like a really kind of good introduction into this sort of longer distance, almost team-based, if you like, running um, with a lot of camaraderie around it. And then ever since then, I've just been hooked. So I it was 2019, I had a go at the Bob Graham round. Um, and spent like a good six months training up for that and and got around there in like quite a respectable time. Year after that, I then thought carrying on like with the rounds, I did the Paddy Buckley round and, and finished that one. And then that brings us sort of to um, this last year. There were a few things last year, like I, I did the Lakeland 50, got quite a good time, a good place on that. Did the Charlie Ramsey round a few weeks before the Lakeland 50. And then that took me straight into the Dragon's Back. So I hadn't done too much on the... On the racing front, I'd done more on like the rounds and trying to, um, I guess, like set those quite hefty, like personal challenges. Um, and then it was only because of a few friends talking a lot about the Dragon's Back and having a volunteer at the Dragon's Back that I thought, you know what, this is, uh, this is quite a big, big feat. It kind of really appealed to me because of that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to throw myself into this and see how fit I can get, give myself a year to train for it. And then, uh, yeah, put everything out on the on the table. I wonder if all your experience of doing the rounds and being out there on your own and then being personal challenges really helped you with the way that, that you ran that Dragon's Back race because it looked like a lot of your competitors fell by the wayside racing hard. And I wonder if you were slightly better at the self-sustainability because w- would that be right? Yeah, I think, but I was, because so when I went into the Dragon's Back, I knew, I only actually knew of Simon, really. Um, He was like, kind of, I I wasn't going into it thinking I can probably win this. I was going into it thinking I'm going to give it everything I can. And if I come out with like sort of a top five, top three, I'd be really happy with that. But Simon was the only person that I knew of of going into that race. So I thought day one, I'm just going to try get a feel for at least like what his pace felt like. Um, And so I just, I set off with him. Um, sort of stuck on his heels up until like some of those first mounds. And then I let him like kind of, I uh, say let. Um, <laughs> I, did, I, I, did, I didn't let, like he developed like a bit of a gap between the two of us. But I was quite ha- comfortable just hanging back like sort of three, 500 meters from it. Even from day one, I was quite keen that I was like, it's a six day race. There is no point like basically emptying the tank on day one because the chances of like recovering that night to then go and do it again the day after is just slim. And you've just got this continual attrition going on within the Dragon's Back. I don't know whether it's because of the rounds or like that was just my mindset going into this was that I kind of need to have that bit of self-preservation because it's a six-day race. If I'm feeling good on days five and day six or relatively good day five and six, that's where I'm happy to really, really like put myself in a deep, dark hole. But up until that point, for me, it was more about just get through and make sure that I've got more to give on the following days. Always more to give. That's one of my mottos of daily life, really. (laughs) 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 We've jumped straight into Dragon's Back, so let's just go, let's go all in on Dragon's Back now. Can you just tell us a little bit, people might be listening going, what is this race? I've never heard of it. Tell us a little bit about um, the format of the race, the sort of general stats of the race. So the the Dragon's Back is, it's a six day race um, and it starts in the north of Wales in Conway. And it goes all the way from Conway down through most of the mountain passes um, and ends up finishing in Cardiff Castle or we finish in the grounds of Cardiff Castle. So it ends up being, I think it's about 240 miles. So roughly about 40-ish miles per day. And then you've got, I think it's like 54,000 feet of climbing across the week. So 
and there's a lot of climbing in those first two to three days. Then you've got a flatter day on day four. Day five is in the Brecon Beacon, so that's an, a massive day towards the end. And then at the very end, they chuck in this, for I think for lots of like sort of mountain trail runners, a horrible day, which is just predominantly on the roads and towpaths. It's a tough way to finish when you've spent so much time in the mountains. So that's, I think, the overall like kind of stats of it, really. I think there was about 250 people did it this last year. There's 400-ish signed up, so there's quite a lot of people who didn't turn up at the beginning. It went from, it used to be an event that was run every two years, and it's now turned into an event that runs every every single year. Yeah, I think that, that's the overall stats on it. I suppose day one, everybody starts together, but then after that, you maybe can pick and choose your start time to within a certain window, is that correct? Yeah, that's it. So day the day one, I think we set off at 6 a.m., like everybody together from Conley Castle. And then you, it was just like, as soon as you get into the camp, that's it, day's finished. You can then spend the rest of the day in the camp, eating lots, stretching, trying to recover, get yourself ready for the next day. But based upon for like people who are maybe coming in a little bit quicker, if I think, say, you were under a cutoff of, I don't know, eight hours or something like that, they mandated your start time the day after. So we had to start after 8 or 8.30 in the morning. So people who were just slightly outside of those cutoffs, you could then start anywhere from 6 a.m. in the morning. So there were people who were out. Oh, wow. And these are the absolute troopers. Like People were out from 6 a.m. in the morning, not getting back. The cutoff in the evening was 10 o'clock at night. And there were people like sort of edging within five minutes of that cutoff every wow. single evening. So they're out for such a long time. I think yeah. we had it easier. We were only out for like eight, nine hours a day. But my God, to be out there for, yeah, 14 or so hours, maybe more than that you're is... You're lying in your tent and you hear people finish, you hear the tent <laughs> and you're finishing and you're like, oh my God. Like, they've got to do all that admin and feed themselves, which yeah, just yeah. takes longer and longer, doesn't it? As you get more and more tired, when you get to the tent, realise you haven't got your spork and you're like, oh, all the way back. Um, and that, yeah, and then, and then you hear them again in the morning and you think, oh, I can stay in my... Back for another hour. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they haven't said what to say. If they're getting in at like half past nine, they're probably not going to get to sleep until, if they do get to sleep, until 11 yeah. ish yeah. at the earliest. Yeah. And then they're getting up again, maybe at, like you hear the camp coming to life at about four o'clock in the morning. It's just, <laughs> it's a real spectacle to see like throughout the week, like what the camp looks like and and, and how everyone's faring. But it's, it's the camp is, and Gary, I know you're speaking before about like, well, maybe being there later this year. But the camp is where there is an awful lot of just, yeah, camaraderie building, friendships building, people having some really good discussions afterwards. So it's the camp life is as good as doing the running itself. I'm really looking forward to that aspect, the uh, camp life. I've not done an enormous multi-day event, but I have done a, a race which did involve sleeping in a village hall at the end of day one. And yeah, just I think waking up that next day and there was the sizzling of the breakfast being cupped and the cups of tea and everything chinking and everybody just waking up. I, I absolutely love that side of it. But I'm interested, you know, you said about how you'd kind of see how the week went and then maybe make your move. Did you, um, how did the, the race go? Did you have to make a move or was it more of a case that people maybe fell to the, to the wayside as the days progressed? Don't get me wrong. Like I wasn't, I wasn't going easy by, by any stretch of the imagination in like those first like four days or so. I was, I was at the upper edge of like my, my comfort zone. Like I didn't really get into that zone where I was like, if I keep going like this, like I'm just going to drop off. But I was giving it quite a lot because it, we had those mandated start times each morning. I typically, like, so on the first day, I think I came in second, second day I came in second, third day I might have come in third. I can't, can't remember exactly, but there was three of us each day. So there'd be Simon Roberts and then Chris Coat. And we were all setting off roundabout within sort of 10, 15 minutes of, minutes of each other. But I would typically set off first. Um, and I, I'd kind of like in my head, because I, I know those, especially Chris Cope, like he, I think he was quite new to um, like doing these sort of longer distance multi-day events, as was I. But he went like a bat out of hell on those first three days. Like he, he destroyed, like destroyed Simon and I, like he, I don't know if he was getting like sort of records. Is this on, the guy on who was? Um, he, had, he didn't have a t-shirt on. He was. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I mean, he was he was running running these races as if it was a ten mile fell race. Really? Um, like <laughs> he was flying down the hills and flying up them. Um, 
So I thought I'm not gonna, I'm not going to try keep up with him because my quads would just get smashed to pieces if I go go for the fell running approach down the hills. Yeah. Um. So I left Chris to it, and then Simon, I think he had quite a rough like first three days. Um. And so actually, like I was, I, I almost Simon would overtake me like midway through the morning. I think he'd have like a, a yeah a good morning, and then he ended up I think he bonked like twice. Um, on the energy front. So then I kind of caught back up with him later in the day. Um, and that was how it went for the first three days. The fourth day, um, I think was where maybe Chris started to struggle a little bit and, and, uh, the and, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, potentially like that maybe started to, to, to bite back there. Um, but Chris was also a type one diabetic as well. So he had other um, oh, other significant um, physiological challenges like going on. And so, yeah, day four, like things started to change a little bit. And then day five was, so I knew Simon knew the Brecon Beacons, like he's sort of from that neck of the woods. Um, he knows the Brecon Beacons exceptionally well. And, and he went for it. He put the, put the burners on that day. Um, and again, I didn't really try to keep with him because he was going so, so quick. I thought I'm just going to kind of stick at this pace that I'm going at. Like it was a good pace. Um, and Simon, I think he got past uh, story arms up Penavan, And I think it was on one of the next ones, possibly that like Fanny big where I think he called it a day and he'd got a stretch fracture in his shin. Okay. Um, and he then hobbled off back down to the, to the camp. And then it was at the end of that day where I got in and because Simon had dropped out and Chris had sl slowed down quite a lot. I was then in first place and the last day was a racing start. And so I had to start first at 6 a.m. And then everybody oh, you else was first. You didn't start yeah. last. No, no, no. Oh. Start started first. And I knew because so Chris had been like he was been at Kona doing triathlons. Um so serious, serious like um caliber of athlete. Oh. And I was just waiting for him and he ran every day without his top on. And I was just waiting on that very last day. I was like, I'm not very good on the road. I'm not a quick, quick runner by any means, but I can, at least I can go relatively speedily. Uh, and I was just waiting for him to like, come behind me. I was like, there's going to be someone topless chisel smashing abs. the poles. Where are those chisel yeah, abs yeah, coming? Yeah. Um, he's got a nice tan as well. Like he, he had it all going on. He looked good in the pictures. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'll mind the same either. Um, and it was such a lovely, lovely bloke. And I was just waiting for him to, to kind of come into sight. And then it really, I had a 50 minute buffer going into okay. that final day on, on Chris. So if he got neck and neck with me, that would have been the point at which like it really was going into the red zone and it would have been a foot race to the end, but that didn't happen. Um, what did happen just, when you did anybody, no, anybody come past you on that, <gasps> but it must no. have been a long day. That's like anxiety the whole day. It was a long day and it was, there's so much, like so much, um, like just concrete trails and like, did you change it, your shoes? Did you know that for the last day? Cause I remember a few I, people. I, yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't wrecked. No, I hadn't wrecked yeah. that last day. Um, so I just stuck with the same pair of shoes pretty much the whole week. Um, and by the end, like I needed a new pair of those shoes. They were wrecked by the end. They had no, no grip left whatsoever. Um, but no, like it was, it was that last day for me was probably the hardest one of all of them, just because it was just had to keep like a constant good pace going. Um, and I looked back, I think Simon and Russell Bentley's time the year before they, I think they like were around about like eight and a half minute miling on the last day oh, wow. last yeah. year, um, over 40 miles. And I, I did it in something like 10 and a bit. So I was going notably slower than they did, but it was that for me mentally was the most difficult day. It's a good job you didn't have to. I always, um, if I can do maths, then I know I'm kind of still with it in my head. But yeah, with all this kind of accumulation of time, I, 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 I suppose, yeah, it'd be nice that you didn't have to really do much maths of that, that, that last day to work out if people were going to catch you, what your buffer was. And I'm making a note, road shoes or something with yeah, a bit cushioning. For day, day, day. Yeah, de definitely something with definitely something with, with a bit of cushion. I reckon a bit of hoker, a hoker action on the last day would be quite good with a bit yeah. of grip, but um, cushioning. Or North Face. Oh, yeah. A lot of North Face chat. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you as a racer? It sounds like you're pretty controlled, let people do what they're going to do. But are you a bit more stressed out 
done that? Uh, no, definitely. I'm I'm not stressed, and I'm probably like I don't know if I take it seriously enough when I'm in. I, I definitely I take the training and the preparation very seriously, but when I'm in these events, like, and I think everyone would attest to this, like I chat quite a lot to people, <laughs> and um, I don't think Simon because I tried to chat to Simon. Uh, I actually had like quite a good chat with Chris. Chris was fairly chatty. Um, but no, I, I do do a lot of talking because I really enjoy just like being out in the mountains, like with very like-minded people. Yeah. Um, so I don't typically stress much when I'm doing the event. Um, but the Dragon's Bat was different, like because it was six days, as I say. Um, like you kind of took each day as it came, whereas something like the Lakeland 50, which I did a few months before that, that really was, whilst I did do a bit of chatting to people on the route, <laughs> That was very much like an, yeah. and that was actually like an all out effort. And I got to the end of that and I was, I was spent by the end of it. Um, so I think it just depends on the event. I'm trying to like in my head, like plan roughly like how, how much energy can go into it and how I need to almost like separate that energy out or, or spread that energy chatting out, should I say? Scale. Yeah. Chatting yeah. Scale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the chat, the chatting scale and the energy scale. Yeah. So spine next year, I feel it well. Who, who, there might not be any, might not be anybody around, but um, <laughs> I'll be chat, chat to myself if not. <laughs> sing, sing, sing. <laughs> I'm curious. Go back to talk about the uh, fifty. I've only done the hundred, but as a competitor in the fifty, you go past pretty much all of the hundred runners. Was it what was that like as a as a runner? You could definitely tell who was on the hundred um, because, <laughs> um, the, but by the point by the time they got into Dalmain, they've done fifty miles. Yeah, um, and it, you just you can just tell the 50, 50 runners are fresh legged. Um, typically, don't really have like poles with them. They don't have a massive bag. They don't look sleep deprived, so they were quite easy to spot. I can't remember how many of the hundred runners had actually gone past by the point at which we started. I think we started like in the morning. Well, um, 11 isn't a start. I think it's, I think it's yeah. about three quarters of the field, yeah. doesn't it? Has gone what through. they've gone through. Yeah. <laughs> start at 50. They really don't like it if you slap them on the bum as you go past. <laughs> well, I'll talk to them. <laughs> I must admit, my, I had a mini goal of no 50 runners going past me. It didn't pan out that way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> also, I was well, thinking... There must have been more than I thought then in terms of 100 runners that we passed. Yeah. Um, it's it's such a busy been. race. It's such a busy race. Yeah. There are probably a lot yeah. of them in checkpoints too that you don't really notice because they'll mm. be spending more time in the checkpoints too as you're going through them as well. Yeah, and you're just trying to have like a couple of jelly babies and, and, and leave a lot of leave, yeah, yeah, leave, yeah. Yeah, leave a lot of the food for the, the guys who are actually doing the, the bigger 100 mile event. I get see, quite anxious on, on the start line but you found yourself on six mini start lines did, 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 during the week did your, your nerves go or every day did you have, have nerves it's like it's a really like weird thing the start line of each day of the dragon's back because it, it so it was just me like you just get you have your dibber you dib yourself out and then that's it there's no one else starting with you so it's actually you, you could almost fall into it depends on like what you want to do within the dragon's back but you could fall into like quite a complacent approach really and that like you just dip and then you tootle off yeah whereas like we were having to because i was like trying to push as hard as i could you dip and then you, you're off and it's like what pace do you set off at there's no one else around you how hard do you go for those first like i don't know five ten miles to like warm yourself into it but Did you purposefully I'd... start ahead of simon just to give you that little bit of breathing space so you didn't have to go out from the gun. What was the thinking of like giving him 10, 15 minutes? Or was he just a bit slower eating his breakfast? <laughs> I, I think I got, I wasn't too tactile on that, on that front in terms of the, the setting off. Um, if his so, chat no, I, wasn't very good, you were probably like, oh, <laughs> you're not going to do sing along Disney with me. So. <laughs> um, no, I think I was, I never actually, it was only like afterwards when I found out that they were probably only setting off like five, 10 minutes after okay. me. So yeah. I, because like I was awake from six o'clock in the morning or if not before that, because of the other people in the tent and to wait all of that time until yeah. potentially like half past eight is a long time. So I was, I was also quite keen just to get going as soon as I could. So when eight, eight o'clock came around, I was like, right, you know what? I'm just going to get on with this, go do what I can. And I saw each day is like, you run so much of it on your own and like whilst there was Simon and Chris like knocking around, they were also having like their own individual races. Just if they went past me, it doesn't necessarily mean all that much. And if I pass them, it doesn't mean too much because it can all change within the last day or two. 
Um, so it was all just each day was like an individual race really. Um, and, and yeah, it was, so the start the start line was just uh, almost a non-event really. Like you just yeah, dip out. Climax. Yeah. You dip out. And then at the end of the day, um, there was a bit more sort of a, of an atmosphere than at the end of the day, but there would be other people because some people were set off to almost two hours before we did. There'd be like a nice sort of flow of people going into the camp at the yeah. sort of time at which we were finishing. Always want to get back for the chips, Gary. Because pre-dinner, they could, they give you chips. Yeah, yeah. and soup as well, and soup. Let's talk about your race nutrition. What did that look like, James? Um, a plan or loose plan? No, I had, I had a plan. So I planned to be, in terms of, I planned calories, really, more than anything. So I planned to be out for a maximum of 10 hours a day. That's like what I'd got the calories for. Um, so I had, I think, about 3,000-ish calories a day. And I had an alert set on my, uh, I was actually listening to like one of, I think your podcast at the weekend and you're chatting something about nutrition and, and alerts on watches. But I had an alert set on my watch for every half an hour. And uh, every half an hour, I was eat- I was always eating something every half an hour. Um, and I had a real mix of different food. Like I was quite aware that I'd probably get sick of, sick of certain foods by the end. So I had lots of, I had lots of gels, which I probably didn't make enough of. Like I've never really relied on gels that much in the past, but they actually went down just really easy. Yeah. Gave me some calories. Um, and I, in hindsight, I would have had a lot more gels, but I couldn't do much about that. I had quite a few like cheer charge bars. They were like, they were difficult to get down towards the end just because the amount of chewing that they took. So I, yeah. I would have switched those out probably in hindsight. Um, I had lots of like baby food. So Ella's kitchen, I think it's called. Oh yeah. And yeah. I had, to, I had two of those, had two of those. Baby, two of those. <laughs> one for baby, one for me. Um, I had, though, I had two of those every day and like, I, I never knew what I was going to get when I went into my bag. I just know there's calories in there somewhere. Um, That's what I do. Lucky I have dip. this massive belt, and I'm like, yeah. hey, "Lucky dip, what's? Go- oh, it's a chocolate belt." And then, or you pull out the gel, and you're like, "Gotta get it down." Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It's yeah not exactly. As fun as the Galaxy Bar. No, um, I had other other kind of like supernatural um, pouches as well. They were good. Do you like? I found them a little bit dry, maybe, um, but maybe yeah. a nice change in texture. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it was the, 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 the baby food was the winner for me. Like whenever I got one of those out and I could have, like, it's got a different top on it. And I could feel like when I'd grabbed hold of the top of that, <laughs> I knew that was a good point of the day. So this is like trying to find like mini moments of something positive within the day. The baby food was one of those mini moments. What was the flavor of baby food that you were? Uh, the, the baby banana breakfast. It's uh it's a, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a highlight. That sounds <laughs> delicious. These moments in like a month time when you start squirting those down the babies. She, there's no chance she's having those. They're too expensive. I was just going to say, there'll be no chance. They're, if they're anything like my kids, you'd be like, right, that's a real special treat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One a month, that's it. The rest of it is a frozen cube of sweet potato. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, that, that's race fuel. It's not baby fuel anymore. Yeah, that goes in a different <laughs> cupboard in the house. Yeah, different cupboard. <laughs> Um, and then I had lots of tailwind. Um, I'd mix that in like every other bottle. Um, I think and- um, of everybody that I've coached to Dragon's Back Success, actually tailwind being the base of their nutrition or or another, um, like having that as your calories and your electrolyte and yeah. um, and then topping that up with real food because of the because of the day after day after day as well. I've never um, used Tailwind. Is that supposed to replace too. physical eating or can yeah. you? Well, they say on the packet that it's you don't need anything else, but I don't know yeah. anyone. Bryn actually did the majority of Dragon's Back on Tailwind, but he could take a lot of it. You need to take a lot of it, yeah. but most people supplement with um food tell us a little bit about then your admin into camp when you arrive because this again is a key part to multi-day success isn't it is your administration as Bryn says Ad- admin isn't a place in china go and sort that spine kit out wife <laughs> i was a i was a loser with the admin because i uh i made like a an a4 sheet of paper which basically had like tick boxes yes, to make excellent. sure that i did x y and z yes. um because I thought, like, if I turn into, up into camp and I'm, like, delirious, there is no way I'm going to remember to, I don't know, powder and get my feet properly dry to sort out any blisters. Like, I just forget things. So I had this, I don't know, 
10, 15 points. So I was like, right, I need to do X, Y, and Z. So I'd get in, I'd, I'd eat, I'd have like dioralites to like get my electrolytes back. Um, I'd always like do quite a lot of stretching and like, I took my roller with me as well. So I had the roller. I had like a really yeah. good. Gary, good... this is pro. You yeah, only I love it. I'm waiting for the Normatec boots. Did you have the Normatec boots as well? <laughs> <laughs> Can't fit that within the, in the weight limit, but otherwise I think I would have had them there. I had like a good pair of compression leggings. Yeah. Um, they were straight on. Get my feet dry. It's hard to get on and off then as the days yeah. went on. I always find with compression leggings by like day three or four, the pain in the hip flexors. Yeah, I'd be like, I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were they were hard and they're hard to get off as well. Like it's yeah. they're they're not oh, easy they're at all to be putting on. They're worth it. They're worth it once in a while. I'd go there was always a river. Um there'd be a river or a stream. So I'd try, I, I put on my little notes. I was like, go and have a 20 minute, like sit in the river. And I think that happened twice because um, it was freezing. I love this. This is amazing. Well, I'm just going to take all this down. Well, I can send you, I can send you the sheet, Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The podcast, Gary. You can watch it. You can listen to this on a podcast that goes out. Don't worry. I'm going to hit Angela for another spreadsheet. James for his little admin list. I'll get all this. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else did you have on? I think... It even it even had things like go to the toilet in the morning. Like I was just, just yeah, but it was it was fine fine level stuff. So um, I wasn't going to forget anything major. But the, a big one was like when I got into the camp each night was to get your feet dry as, mm. and get your feet sorted as soon as you can. And then I put waterproof socks on um, to just keep them dry then until the next day. And that was that was a big thing because there's a lot of people walking around just with like flip flops on and socks on and. And you can just be getting your feet wet again. And I think you yeah. potentially need to keep them dry. Yeah. Good tip. Did you kind of get involved with the other competitors, you know, sitting around chewing the fat or were you just literally get yourself away, take care of yourself and catch up on your sleep? A, a bit of both really. Like I'd, so our, all of our tent mates, they, they were all actually finishing like quite reasonably early. So the majority of them would be back in by like six o'clock at night. So it was good. We'd always have a catch up with those guys, but we'd also all be doing like admin at the same time. So there'd be like stretching going on and chatting going on, but I didn't really spend too much time in the food tent. I was quite keen, like going there, eat as much as I needed to have a bit of a chat, but then get myself into like bed as soon as I could. Um, and I had everything then set up in bed so that I didn't really need to get out of bed until the following morning. Another good thing to get like massive water bottle to have in your uh, in your camp bag so you don't need to then get out. The only thing you will have to do is get out to do a wee and much easier for a man than a woman. So a key point for anyone doing it next year is like watch out for the soup. Like there's there's lots of stuff in that soup that make you need to go to the toilet for other reasons. Um, <laughs> and you can't, you can't do that in a bottle. No. Um, <laughs> so I'd maybe limit the amount of soup that you have, albeit that it tastes good. It's got quite a lot of stuff in it that makes you need to go to the loo. Everything you do is part of the race. I've got that on the top of my checkpoint when I get into checkpoints for the spine is at the top. I saw someone else, so I've copied it. It's not my own idea. Is <laughs> you, you are still in the race. Keep moving because yeah. I know I'm going to get into the checkpoints warm. First time you've been warm, yeah, like yeah. Well, <laughs> sit there and start staring at a wall and not do anything. So I wait till they start bringing you lasagna as well. At Alston. Yeah, and then I'm just going to say, I'm going to be like, right, do all this and then have your moment of relaxation and let it, let it relax a bit. But you've got to do all these, these four things before you get in. Um, you talked a little bit, we read it somewhere that you, you didn't really perhaps get to appreciate the beauty of the race because you were chasing Simon and Chris over the hills. Is that the way or did you manage to have a few moments when you were... Um, running to look because it is the most amazing part of the country and a part that yeah. lots of people wouldn't normally get to see because it is very remote as well no i think that that for me like i wouldn't change it in hindsight because i wouldn't have probably been able to do what i did if i looked around as much but no i, I was very much i'd seen the vast majority of the route apart from the elan valley i'd seen the vast majority of the route like on reckies um so whilst it would have been lovely and like we had like really good conditions on crib cock as well on the race day, but it was just, to be honest, it was always like head down looking at literally where like almost every foot was going because yeah. it only takes like one foot to go wrong. You slip before hurt yourself and you're out of the race. So, um, it was, it was, whilst I do chat a lot, like I was also very focused on what, like what was coming up next, like where each foot was going. 
I had all of the, there's like multiple checkpoints. I think there's like, I don't know, 15-ish checkpoints that you've got to go through each day. And I had each one of those checkpoints programmed into my watch. So I'd just be, I was navving via my watch. Like I had the map as a backup, but I did the majority of the nav via the watch. And I was just kind of just looking at my watch, counting down the meters to get into each of those checkpoints. And it was just another like little bit. It's like, right, you've ticked yeah. that bit off. Um, and so that really worked quite well in terms of, yeah, just the checkpoint by checkpoint, uh, seeing it that way, then seeing it day by day. Never, I never really looked at the race as a whole. Oh no, can't even. <laughs> um, you, your highest high and your lowest low, can you pinpoint what those were? Um, the winning. Uh, yeah, the, the highest high was, was definitely coming in. Uh, it, Coming in at the end, and also on day day five when I went across um, the reservoir wall at Usk, and I knew I well I thought my my wife said she was going to be there, um, and I thought I hadn't really heard much from her, but anyway she was there. But then another friend had also like turned up uh, who I do a lot of running with, and I don't know it just like it really got to me like it was a really like nice moment just to sort of see him. I've done so many bloody miles with him. He's done the Dragon's Back in years gone by too. Um, so that was a real high to see both him and my wife and the dog. Um, the end was obviously a dog. I love it. <laughs> but he's, he's a big running partner too. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the end was, the end was big and the setting off as well. Like setting off to the male voice choir was quite spectacular too. Were there and tears? low, pardon? Were the tears? Yeah. Uh, at, at the well, at the end there, where at the beginning I was um, sort of you stiff, were manly, you were manly. Yes, stiff upper lip at the beginning. I was like, no, I can't get distracted by them too much. I've got to <laughs> keep my head in the game. But no, the yeah, yeah. Any real lows when you thought I can't do it? I can't do it. Um, there were. What day was it? I mean, the the last day there were like the last day there were lots of lows. Whilst I never really thought I'm not going to be able to get to the end, like just the monotony, endless, yeah, the monotony of running on those like flat towpaths and 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 pavements. You've spent five days in gorgeous, gorgeous countryside, and then you go from that to running through towns and fairly big towns in the south of Wales. People, I guess, as well when you're that tired, seeing people. Yeah, yeah, and then on the last day as well, actually, they put um. There was um, a deviation that they put in, but like the deviations are usually very, very small. But this one was, I don't know, a two, three mile deviation. It was massive. And I had like everybody on the trackers at that point, like watching. <clears throat> and like we, we'd moved off like the, the noted course. Yeah. And like I had like all well, quite a few people like ringing me, like trying to make sure that I, I wasn't too far. I, I was doing it uh, purposefully. That was a bit of a stressful moment. Yeah. Oh, you don't need that when you've got no, no, Chris, no. Chris the Adonis chasing you down. <laughs> <laughs> no, you definitely don't need that. Definitely don't need it. And there was no one else around, so I had no idea whether or not I was going the right way. There were a few, few signposts either. I think the farmer had got disgruntled and took a lot of the, the signs down, so oh it was running goodness, blind man. for quite a long time. What was the infrastructure? Because sometimes when you're on course, it can be quite lonely and isolated, but then you get back to camp. Is it like a, a mini mini festival or something? And so I volunteered at it the year before I did it just to try and get a sense of like what the camp was like. And they basically have like two camps. So they're always setting up the day in advance. Um, but it really is like they have like, every, so they've got a big kitchen and a big food tent. And I think it's those that they set up like a day ahead. So that it's all ready for the day after when people come through. Um but everything does like get lifted up and moved down through the country. But they've got this year, they had a drying room, which was like, you could go to the river, wash your clothes, put it in the drying room and they would be bone dry, like come morning. So that was good. They had yeah. a charging station for like your watches and your head torches. If you needed your phones, um, what else did they have? They had like a big, like the food tent, but they also had like loads of bean bags in there for people to like relax on. Um, the kitchen, toilets, no showers or anything like that. So if people are expecting showers, there aren't showers. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and that, that's, and that's, um, I think that's about it really, what they've got there. And then they've got all like the admin tents and like the, the communications tents, the race control tents and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff that gets moved all the way down the country throughout the week, all in, uh, Lots of uh, transit vans, That's just a, a, a train of them going down the country. It's like it's convoy. quite a, a logistical, um, it's very impressive. What about physios though? Would you, could you get a, a massage at the end of the day? 
Nothing. No, no, no. Yeah. There's no, so you're not allowed any outside help. Um, so that's like both on the course and like in the camp, like no one from like family members, friends, etc. they can't come into the camp. It's just purely for competitors yeah. and event team. And even out on the course, they say like, if, if anyone's going to help you, they've got to be able to and willing to um, help every single person. Yeah. So that's the kind of the, the rule that they go by, which I think is a good one. I love the spirit of that because that really does level it, say, for people who aren't local and can't rely on half a dozen of their friends to come and place them for a section or something. I yeah. like, uh, like yeah. the no, I think it's good. Yeah, it is. It's good. It's really good. Um, yeah, so that's the that's kind of like the, the rough like way in which it works. But no, no physios. So, and I think there, there were quite a few people with rollers and I was like, again, trying to consider like, can I put the massage gun in there? But that yeah. just didn't quite get within the weight limit. Oh, okay. So there is a weight limit with the, with the items you can take into the camp. You've got, I think, 15 kilos that you can have for the camp and then two and a half kilos for your day bag. Yeah. Oh my goodness, man. Uh, so much, so it's, much... it's tight. It's tight. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's, you're weighing, you are having to weigh everything out to, to get it within the limit. And then on the day of the, the very first day of the Dragon's Back, you see lots of people getting their bags weighed yeah. and decanting things like into the car boot because oh, they're just wow. over by a few kilos. Yeah, yeah, cool. Oh, wow. We talk about kit then. Any standout bits of kit? Um, without doubt, like, and quite contentious, but I think the poles were really, like, good. Um, just because, like, it just takes, like, a little bit of pressure off, like, your lower body. And I think that, for me, was pretty much imperative. Like, I used them everywhere. Like, I didn't just use them on the climbs. I used them on the flats. Didn't really use them too much on the downhills. But, um, yeah, I used them. 99% of the time. So the poles are a big one. Yeah. Um, shoes, like I changed, like I went for a pair of, I was going to go for Las Sportiva's jackals, but I hadn't managed to break them in enough before the event. So three weeks out from the event, I got a pair of um, their Akashas and I, I just bit the bullet and I was like, they felt good. They felt comfy on a training run before and I just, I risked it. But they, they actually turned out to be a really, really brilliant shoe for the event. And I, I wore those for, well, at least like 90 percent of the whole race so they two bits of kit there the shoes were good um and then yeah the poles were another big one i think we're all massive uh fans of poles on this podcast definitely <laughs> keep me up. i use them all day even when i'm not yeah. running. weapons <laughs> yeah. kids dogs <laughs> i get really um i remember on the lakeland 100 at least at the very at the early at the start of the race um I did harpoon a few people with the pole, so <laughs> it'd be nice when the trail thins out a bit, at least, to get them out. No, yeah, good. especially when you're going up like a, a narrow bit uphill and they yeah. potentially slip backwards. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes it's like you think you'd have purchased with them, but you wouldn't. You just kind of kick back with sort of say some fresh air, but then it'd be somebody else's shin or something. You might kind of be surprised then, should they give you a bit? Yeah. Of <laughs> back off. Please keep two meters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go. Patreon question, shall we? Shall I ask yeah. Megan's? Button? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Megan Owen has uh, put this question in for you, James. What, if anything, was the piece of training or preparation that you did for Dragon's Back that you felt led to your success? Was it just a case of lots of training or did you do anything specific for the race? Um, every, no, everything was specific for the race. Like, for a whole year, every bit of training really was specific for that. Like no matter what I did in the year up to like Charlie Ramsey, the Lakeland 50, they were just like sort of warm for events for the main thing, which was the dragon's back. Um, so right from for a whole year, I was doing a ton of climbing. Um, I was doing a lot of work with the poles to get myself used to them. I'd never run with them like prior to that I did. And I've never done it before, like gym work, mobility work, um, stretching, like, but I was never really doing like the volume that I was doing either for this. Like I was sort of tapping out at maybe like between 18 and hundred miles, like a week, almost week in week out. So I needed to do like the stretching and the mobility to keep going with that. They were quite key for me. I did a lot of upper body work as well to try. I mean, not that anyone would notice, but um, just to try and help with the poles, because again, like you can build up a lot of fatigue in your arms and your shoulders from the poles. So I, I did a lot of upper body work just to help with that. Um, and actual like specific things event wise, we went, there's a couple of friends and I, we went and wrecked days one to three in like back to back. So we kind of, we did basically the first, at least the first third, if not a little bit more of the race um, in a consecutive effort, which was quite good just to get a feel for like what your body felt like after doing those big back to back efforts. 
Um, and I did a lot of back-to-back sessions too in training. So I'd have, I think again, I heard someone talking about it on the podcast and I thought it'd work quite well for my training was big hill session on a Friday night out for, I don't know, 25, 30 miles on a Saturday morning with lots of hills and then do the same again on the Sunday. And I'd do one of those maybe like once a month just to try and, I don't know if the, what the science is like around it, but just to try and get my body used to those like hard efforts day after day. Yeah. Um, and I feel I can't say whether or not that was the bit that worked, but it felt beneficial at the time. Mm, those Sounds little mini home training camps. I love those. I always think that <laughs> some, sometimes they're harder mentally than physically. You get home and then you've got to do life admin and then get yourself back out again. They are harder sometimes than the race as well, because in the race that you only got to think about yourself. And then when yeah, you come yeah. back, you've got, and also you've got the luck you are at home. So it's harder than to get back out again when you're like day three and your eyes are like, you're like, so yeah, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's great advice as well. And I think mm-hmm. wrecking day one to three, Gary, if there's any bits you're gonna uh, recce and go down and do it consecutively as well. Well, I'm mindful. It's quite a way f- distance from where I live, so probably most of the training will happen over in the Lake District, <clears throat> and probably on the Bob Graham round kind of terrain. So. I know it's not perfect, um, but I think it might be okay if it's a good to I kind of replicate what I'm going to see on the day. But it, like I said so. today in the podcast, it's there's, there's six different races and not every day is equal. You said the last day there's a lot of road running. So maybe some time spent on maybe the Lake 100 kind of uh, trails would yeah, yeah. be good too. But yeah, definitely I think it would be good if I can get away um and have a, a multi-day recce for at least day one and two i think that will be yeah. awesome they're, they're the, i think they are the you've got like fourteen thousand feet i think in the first day and it's over 32 miles so it's it's a lot of value for money in terms of climbing um but it's, it's like again like you say late district and like the the rockier bits maybe of legs three and four like they probably um sort of emulate it quite well yeah okay in terms of what the days one and two might be like Fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're very familiar with that anyway, so uh, you, I'm yeah. sure you'll be fine. Yeah, there's that one and there's the uh, Old Cammy Tops too. So again, you know, 30 odd miles and some pretty good elevation for at least yeah. England at least. Um, so yeah, well, that's what it's going to be. I can't justify trip to the lakes, uh, trip to Wales every weekend. I would be it's not very way, popular at yeah. home. <laughs> <if I did. laughs> We've got another Patreon question from Rebecca Morn and she has said, read about Dragon's Back or any mahusive event. She would be interested to understand more the mental process that takes place that entices people people to make that giant leap of faith and give it a try how an individual knows or feels prepared enough to move on to the next level i think in terms of like signing up for these things at least for me it's trying to find something that's maybe I, i'm always trying to find like what that upper limit is and like that upper limit does end up it keeps getting like bigger and bigger and bigger and the ceiling keeps like getting higher so the next one the big event for me the next one will be like the spine and it's well eddie you'll know it's a scary scary looking event when you think about that far in the dark and like the bleary conditions um <laughs> so it's but that's the bit and i don't eddie i don't know what it is for you but like that's the bit that excites me is like that not knowing like whether or not you can do it and then in training, I'll just do everything that I can to make sure that I can do it. Um, and having those big, scary goals, definitely for me, I like the, the, they motivate me quite a lot in terms of then just to get the training done. Yeah, I don't know, Eddie, I don't know if that's the same same for you when you signed up to the spine. Still don't think I can do it. It's only like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, totally. I love that. And I love it when people go, no, you're not. How far? And I'm like... Yeah, I'm like, I don't know if I can do it, but you never know until you find out. So I would say, Rebecca, don't let anything, and I, again, another life motto I live with, don't let anything be your limiter. The uh, yeah. sky's the limit. Go and see. And if you f- if you fail, I don't like the word fail, but if you don't achieve, go back again. You know, it's never, it's always a learning with ultra running. Yeah. Um, it's always, a, you'll always learn something about it. You'll always be a better person, even if it mm. all goes absolutely wrong. And I end up at Middleton with <laughs> Gary changing my pants. <laughs> I do reflect back. I reflect back on even some road races that didn't go well. And Bob Graham round first time that, that didn't pan out how I'd hoped. 
and you just use them as fuel and motivation for hopefully that's a successful attempt. Mm. Um, like you're never going to set out on something like a 200 plus mile event. I think where this is going to be a walk in the park, but yeah. your body like just gets eventually just gets you used to moving and you're not going at the same pace as you're doing in a marathon. Like you, you are conserving your energy. So you can just keep plodding along and keep going forwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. With that. I I don't know. I've not done over. I've not done over a hundred miles, so I don't know. But I I I when I talked to James about it, and he's done Tour de Gien, and I was like, he's like, the pain is quite different because running a hundred mile race, you are running. You're like running hard. I'm a racer, so I'm racing hard. That pain of like the last twenty five miles, you don't get that in a two hundred mile race because it's a it's a war of attrition. Yeah. And um, so I think like approaching every event differently as well. Don't let anything stand in your way, Rebecca. Let, uh, let, um, yeah, what, what you ever you want to do, set it. You can do it if you tell us. Yeah, s- sign up. Sign up. <laughs> uh, you've been a great. I hope Dragon's Back need to give you another place, James. You've been a great. Um, you've sold it to all of us. Gary's like rubbing his hands together with the, yeah. the camp life. <laughs> What's being cooked up now for this year and next year? You you sort of touched a bit on your plans. We, we had a baby at the beginning of um, of December, so I, I hadn't really got too much planned, but quite quickly got itchy feet and I've got, um, my wife was like quite keen to like um, kick me out of the door <laughs> to do the training. So I've signed up to the, um, the Northern Traverse at the beginning of April, which is about 180 miles, like going from coast to coast. So the training has like properly begun for that now. I'm going to, so that'll be the next big one. Um, and it'll be good to see how that one goes. But I feel like my body's in quite a good place at the moment. So I'm hoping that I can train hard for that and, again, compete at that one as well. Um, then I was going to have another go at the Bob Graham round in the summer. Um, I'd done it a few years back, and I just want to see whether or not, if I am potentially fitter, stronger than I used to be. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to – but, again, it's all condition, condition dependent. But I would like to just – go and, and really give it absolutely everything I've got on the Bob Graham again and just see what time I can potentially do. And then the spine next winter, I think, will be the, the main one for me. Um, so I'm trying to, to line things up for that and pull together some training plan, long-term training plan for the spine. God, that sounds super busy. Some massive uh, days and multiple multiple days out there. Uh, Andy, clockwise or clockwise, Bob? Will you just recreate what you did last time, hopefully? Or Yeah, so I went, went clockwise. I was going to think about clockwise and anti-clockwise, then that could be the baby brain. Uh, yeah, clockwise. So going going up uh, skid off first. And that was, the, that was the way I did it last time. But I had a very bad like leg warm on the last time I did. So I've got at least an hour to kind of take off there, but it might bite me somewhere else throughout the event. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you, can't, make... you can't plan it to go very straightforward, can you? <laughs> I've heard good things also about the Northern Traverse. We had uh, Lisa Watson on, didn't we? It sounds like an awesome, awesome race, that. Yeah, yeah. It should uh, should be a really, really good one. And they have like the Lakes Traverse as well. It's run by the guys who run Dragon's Back, but they have the Lakes Traverse and everyone sets off at the same time. So yeah. in a similar kind of way to the Lakeland 50 and 100, you've got two different groups of people, one doing 60 miles and the other's doing 170 miles. So it'll just be trying not to get swept up yeah, in the I'm pace of the 60, don't, 70 milers. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really yeah. take a pebble. Some people take a pebble, don't they, from coast to I coast? I don't know if that's. I don't know if it's like. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a tradition, isn't it, to do that? And I don't know whether or not they won't mandate it, but I think they might recommend that you do. So yeah, I'll carry a very small pebble <laughs> from one side to the other. I'm just glad it goes from west to east. I think that would usually be quite a horrendous run, r- running into that um, headwind all the way. If you had to do from east to west, that would be yeah, tough. yeah. Yeah, it would be really, really tough. Should we do the quick five? Eddie, anything else? Ooh, good to go. Okay, right. If you if you could have an unlimited supply of one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? Pizza. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't even a breath. No, no. I think pizza. I absolutely love pizza. I love yeah. pizza too. Pizza. You never have it's, it's a winner, isn't it? It's, such a, it's got everything you want. Everything you want. And it can be different every time. Yeah. I'd have a yeah. night. Tonight. The kids would love it. Kids love it too. Oh, this is quite a good question, actually. If you had to give someone a book to read, what would it be and why? 
do you know what? This is bad. Like, and especially with my job, I don't actually read that many books. I, um, especially because of your brain. Been an academic yeah, on the no. show, sorry. Got PhD. <laughs> gonna, he'll have some good. No, like, no, it's it's very bad. Like, um, in terms of books that I have, I couldn't actually, I couldn't really give you one. Like, I mean, you, there's the boring academic books which you like jump into chunks of, but you never read those cover to cover. Danny Champion of the World. I think that's the first t- uh, teacher read it to us at school, and it was the first time I think I actually enjoyed a story. It was wonderful. I was Mr. Honey, say, don't worry, James. Soon you'll have the Gruffalo. Yeah, <laughs> you have all the classics. Yeah. You'll have all the classics that you. We've got a little bookshelf. It's already yeah, building up for her. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. A lot of presents have been booked so far for her. Oh, it's the best. Kids reading is the best. My littlest one, she's now reading all those books to me. She's <laughs> annoyed. She's like, "You're not sitting and listening." And I'm like, "Babes, I know these books so well." I don't need to <laughs> because I've read them for 14 years. <laughs> you just need the first word and then the rest is like in, in memory. Yeah, they've all got such memories that I'm like, oh, it's not long. She'll be like, I don't want to read that anymore. And then I'll be like, oh, they've all gone. So, but you've got all that. <laughs> or, or, yeah, no, you've got a girl, so it won't be a boy throwing the book at your head going, oh, <laughs> it's not match of the day. I'm not reading that. Yeah. <laughs> She'll definitely have like, uh, well, we've always got like Harry Potter books knocking around there too typically the ones that put us to sleep even as uh, adults. So they get read a lot, but it's quite not, they're not the best one to uh, maybe admit to. No. Maybe maybe not for a six-week-old. That's a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe it might be a bit too long for her. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next question? Okay, yes. Uh, oh, it could be like the multiple rollover lottery win. You are the jackpot winner or you wake up one day the fittest man on the planet. Probably go for the money side of things. I think I think right right now in terms of where, where the world is at, I think yeah. a, a little a few extra pennies to yeah, it might go quite a long way. You yeah, could do a lot like, of good with I'm that. Already the fittest guy is like I, yeah. I, 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 I the money. <laughs> Ultimate the, the, the money would help get a fitter, I'm sure. So it might give yeah. me an excuse not to work and then I can just hammer the training. So <laughs> I'd go for that one. What object do you lose the most? I don't really lose very much. I'm quite good at like putting things in certain places. So I don't typically lose. I, I don't lose things. I'm, I'm going to say that. Like with well, a bit that, of not even your wallet. I'm forever losing my wallet. So my phone, or something else, like keys. I'm always losing keys. <laughs> I am terrible. No, usually, usually I'm quite, quite good with, um, with where I put things. It's harder if like my wife picks it up and then I've got to find it. Um, she, she, she's the one who loses things. <laughs> Hopefully she and that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she wouldn't mind. She wouldn't mind. Cool. Okay. Right. When we um, put the show out to our community at the weekend, I wrestle. It takes me a long time to decide what music I should use with the Instagram story. So I thought I'd hand that responsibility over to you, James, which song would you like us to use for your Instagram story? It could be an artist. I could, you could just be a bit more. Open. An artist. Oh, so yeah, red hot chili peppers. Hot chili peppers. We've got to see Dave something, like something with a bit of like tempo to it as well. I think that'd be that'd be good. James. See, they they red hot chili peppers. They were around when I was a kid, so they've got a lot of songs to. Um... They have maybe something like can't can't stop. Peppers. Okay, can't stop. You know he's going to WhatsApp me in two days and then be like, what was the song again, Eddie? I've wrote it down. There, black and white. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all my list. Spine Admin, Road Shoes for Dear Six, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. There we go. <laughs> we are so good, good. James, thank you so much for giving up your time. Uh, we loved our chat with you. Learned so much. It was so handy for anybody, not just Dragon's Bat, but thinking about a multi-day and the preparation yeah. that went into that. Um, and lovely to hear how much joy you took in the preparation and the race and yeah. going out with Victor as well. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been Looking good. Look forward to following you this year, Little Adventures, and then uh, we'll chat again when I've... Uh, absolutely destroyed the spine and i'll give you all the uh yeah it's in it's in the bag already it's in the bag well the first 10 miles 100 percent. good luck we look forward to seeing little baby out in the running pram too in the next few months and good luck with fitting that all in and thank, thank you. you to the very understanding wife that's kept the baby absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks james you take care thanks cheers thank you bye now
thank you so much, James, for coming on the podcast. Love to hear your story. Love all the little uh, great bits of advice for Gary. And we look forward to following your adventures and the baby in <laughs> 2023. <laughs> what a nice guy. This week, Tales from the Trails, we've got some lots of women crushing it. We had Sarah Perry over in the Lake Districts completing the Lakes, Mears and Waters. Now, it's an unverified winter female record, but the stats are all there. Hundred and Just over 103 miles, 23,691 feet in 29 hours and 39 minutes. I wasn't aware of this route. I apologize. Steve, had you heard of this one before? I've heard of it, but I don't know the... The details of it at all to be honest i think she had some pretty bad weather but she's one tough cookie so that's exciting to see we've also got uh, just a quick hello in between reading some amazing records to rachel watson all the way from new zealand she sent us a wave and gary would like a new section he's yeah. not happy with tales and tales he wants more he always wants more <laughs> furthest away fan do we can we get further away well you what's gotta do well to beat than, yeah what's further than new zealand there is one other place isn't there um, yeah yeah it was great to see elsie davis out on the fells to a new winter female Bob Graham on record in 20 hours and 21 minutes and like Sarah I'm not too sure if it was snowy and stuff like that on the tops I've not seen that kind of information but I know she had some high winds and what was awesome I was uh, doing some serious dot watching over the weekend. In Keswick, they've got a webcam, so you can physically watch them running just that last 100 metres into the marketplace. But yeah, awesome. Well done with that. It was good to see Phil Wood uh, taking part across country at Bexhill with Eastbourne Rovers. I was, um, yeah, I was pretty jealous. Not jealous, you know, it was, it was, it was nice seeing people. It's all the short shorts, the vests, yes. the mud. <laughs> loads of mud you know you can't beat that I love a bit you know we've had cross country and I think last week was the first fixture I could see yes it was definitely a mud fest um, but yeah great to see Phil out there Nick Stevenson had a great day out the hard most 30 and so uh, apologies you can't say well done to all of our listeners because there's so many people that listen to and watch the show taking part on one of the various hard most races over the weekend said it was challenging conditions but still up there with the best it's such a great route there's really good lovely coastal trails cinder track if you kind of want to get your legs moving again awesome just lovely part of the coast over on our Strava Club Gary's favourite part of the week uh, checking in the stacks we have Uga Pep apologies if I pronounce your name wrong with 125.9 miles and Sarah Perry with the most hours <laughs> yeah. 29.42 and the most climbing at 24,623 do you know who's going to win the Strava Club next week Gary well, I, yeah, I would say you, but <laughs> we've got a few Stravas, uh, spine races in our Strava. Yeah, well, I'm going to go to the Cheviot and then that will mean I'll just get that little bit. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but what was Uga doing to be doing 125.9 miles? Um, you know, obviously Sarah, she did over 100 miles her Strava a uh, week, but she only came uh, second to Uga. But... She gutted. She'd be gutted, man. Well done, everybody. Let's have some reviews. I'm I do love a bit review. nervous. I'm feeling a bit like I can't do this. Life's too much. Make me feel a bit better about myself. It's always good to have a review. And we, the first one is PBRVWR19 over on Apple Podcasts. Where the hell did they come up with that? PBRVWR19. <laughs> you ever do that? If you ever like create a new email account, sometimes they see Yahoo suggests an email that you could use. And it is just a random bunch of um, letters. It's like when they suggest the password and you're like, yeah. how, how would I ever retrieve that puppy? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so maybe that's what it is. But only just discovered this great fun podcast that has been a good companion on a couple of cold and wet runs over the Christmas period. Thoroughly really recommended to lovers of both tea and running. Another one on our radar. Nixter! Exclamation mark. 100 exclamation. I love these names. Almost more than a review. Hey, Nixter. Love Eddie and Gary's run chat. So glad Eddie and Gary are back. Look, we only went for like a couple of weeks. People make out that we like... Um, left the country for years <laughs> love hearing about what they've been up to with awesome random chat and some epic random chat and really interesting guests thanks nixter if you uh like the podcast please like share subscribe leave five star review um uh leave us a review we love getting the reviews and thank you to everybody who listens and likes shares and subscribes
you know, we've just done our comeback from illness. So I'm hoping that this is the week that training. <laughs> you can't say anything now because you're learning. Like, uh, I will try my minute on minute off session, see how that goes, see how I recover. But if all goes well, it will be the minutes, five times five minutes and a long run. That is on the loose schedule. I've got down there, maybe the kettlebell class. I'm not going to do that. I've got to get myself sorted too for the spine, uh, doing some volunteering and I'm going to be out of the house for three days. My shift starts at six o'clock in the morning on Monday. So I think I'm probably going to have to go over there Sunday night and travel on Sunday just so I can be ready to start my shift on Monday morning. I'll be also crunching the numbers for the Dragon's Back race, elevation gain, terrain, etc. And just spend a bit more time thinking about that. You know, I initially thought, oh, is it too much, too much to do? And with all the different races I've got planned this year too, but Things like, you know, the old county tops, Lake 100, it is a lot of mixes of terrains and also cut out the bag. There may be a just nail around attempt too. So lots of varied terrain. Not next uh, week. <laughs> not next week, no. <laughs> we'll see how we hold up. But yeah, just having to think about the various sections on the dragon back, the elevation profiles in each of those sections and just seeing how it fits in and what I can do to, like I say, just get me to complete that race but what yeah what is what does this week look like for you my goodness Gary <gasps> right so travel I hate the travel bit I get travel anxiety I hate it I just want to get there so let's get the travel out of the way um a little bit of map um I must not watch crappy Netflix films on the plane and I must look at the maps <laughs> <laughs> but I've got I've got I will get to my accommodation quite early so I will have like a day and a half by myself so I always like to um I'll bury my head down then and get everything out and spend some time looking at the route and the maps and stuff like that that works for me um and just trying not to um <laughs> trying to keep married <laughs> this week <laughs> And then it'll be eyes down until running to you at Middleton, Gary. The way, do you, should we talk a little bit about how I'm going to handle what I'm kind of thinking of how I'm breaking the race down? Yeah, go quickly. for it. Eh? So I'm just like, uh, I'm totally focusing on this as an adventure. I'm not going to be looking at anybody else. What anyone else is doing is irrelevant to me. Um, so I will not be interested in where I am in the field, my stats, my movement. Can't control that. If you try and control that, I think that is when things go tits up. So I am just going to work from, I've worked out different little checkpoints. I'm going to work, especially for the first day and a half when the nerves will still be jangling a bit. You've got fresh legs. You can, you could be potentially moving too fast. I'm really going to try and rein it back. My whole aim, as I've said to Gary before, is to get to Middleton in having, you know, really set myself up for that second half of that race. And now that Gary's going to be at Middleton, I also know that I can just dive into his arms. <laughs> and then, Gary, you just take over. And I've said to Gary, I'm going to arrive at Middleton, a shell of uh, of Eddie. But the aim then is I will have a good, hopefully, reset there asleep and then you've got to send me out whatever so i've broken up the first half of the race quite a lot and then um, the second half of the race i'm just going to try and just really just get in the zone and just every just uh i'm much more confident because one i think the terrain suits me a little bit better maybe as well yep. um yep. and also um you know once you get out of middleton even though you still got such a long way to, to go i do know where i am then um and you're almost starting just working through to get to the finish. Whereas I know before Middleton, this is just, it's such a big picture. So I'm going to try and close that picture down and just really focus on where I am and enjoying it. Try and enjoy it. That's what Britain just keeps saying to me. Come on, you're going to enjoy this. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what part I'm going to enjoy. <laughs> Any part? <laughs> the tea, cups of tea. So I look forward to seeing everybody out on the trail. Hand me tea. And um, I love a selfie. <laughs> Um, yeah, keep me going. If you see me whining, sitting down, sleeping, kick me. You can, you know, I, I got to get to that finish because I never want to do this again. <laughs> It'd be so nice just to get going in the morning. Just get those first 10 miles done. Get that light sweat on. Yeah. Get your first sip of tailwind, first bit of gel across your face, first <laughs> not rocket, and yeah. I'll be in my element. We'll be off. Good luck to anybody doing any of the races. We've rather overlooked that there are lots of other little races. Yeah, what is it? You've you got the Spine Challenger South, Spine Challenger North, and oh, then the main... The sprint. Sprint. Um, oh, you've got the Mountain Rescue do a, a, their separate race as well. So yeah. um, we look forward to reading everyone's tea from, uh, Tales from the Trails. will be totally focusing on everything. Yeah, awesome. Adventure. Volunteer out on the course or doing the race. 
As always, thanks again to everyone who follows the show. It could be on Facebook, Instagram, our Strava Club, and over on Patreon too. There's a link in the show notes that will take you to all the places you can follow along. It means so much to Eddie and I. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hope you all have a great week. Good luck to anybody doing any of these crazy January challenges. Uh, we're not sure about the show next week for obvious reasons. Um, Gary might get some snippets. If I finish when perhaps I plan to finish, we might be able to get a sort of 20 minute, half an hour show out if I'm able to string um, some sentences together. So if it's a bonus, if there is one next week, but they definitely will be back on form the week after. Run well, run wise, refuel with tea. I'm not going to say coffee, Gary. I just refuel with tea. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. Good luck, everybody. That was episode six of Tea and Trails.